I want to welcome all of His Glory Nation as we continue our series in the book of Galatians. Tonight we'll be in Galatians 4. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west, north to south, to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is Christ our Lord. All right, let's get right into Paul's letter to uh, Galatia. Uh, verse 1. Now I say that there, that the, the heir... That the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. So what Paul is trying to explain here is it took the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to come down uh, to be the redeemer of our slavery to uh, the law. We were slaves. And he's talking here uh, that there is no difference between a slave or the heir of the father when he is a child. Because he will have to go through the same things. He hasn't inherited it. He'll have to uh, get to the right age that the father has put in his, uh, his will, uh, whether it be 21 or whether it be 18 or whatever the age is, some do 30. Uh, that's when he would become, uh, you know, literally get the inheritance of the father. But until then, he is, you know, under the, under the law. So Christ is going to set us free. And what this is also showing as a symbolism is that Christ came and set those who accept Jesus Christ in the heart, soul, and mind free. From the law, whether we're Gentile or Jew, no matter race or, or, or whatever we are, we become uh, heirs to the, throne, to the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we become children of the Most High God because of our Savior, Christ the Lord. Again, being Gentile, grafted in, we are, in, we, we are inherited, we're adopted in to, the, to, to God's family through Jesus Christ forever, no matter where we came from. We're born again new in our heart, soul, and mind that our spirit and our soul will live on with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit forever. Verse 2, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. So again, referencing that you know, when you're a child and you have an inheritance, you're no different than the, sl the slaves because you have to do the work. Uh, if a, a proper father would teach their son or daughter to you know, work and have a good work ethic, raise them up in the way of the Lord. And at that certain date that the father uh, provisioned, then they would become an inheritance. Again, symbolizing that uh, Christ came and, and took away the law from us. We're not bond servant, we're not bond slaves to the law anymore. Christ freed us once and for all because of his grace, uh, and he took it to the cross for us. And because of that, and accepting in him, and trusting him, and being obedient to him, and calling him Lord and Savior, we have eternal life that the law cannot take us to the second death, which is sin. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the, under the elements of the world. So they were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, born of a woman. Again, prophesizing Genesis 3.15, where, where the seed of the woman would, would crush the head of the, the seed of the snake, meaning uh, the serpent, uh, Satan, and was born of a virgin woman, according to the scriptures, and born under the law. Jesus came to replace the law. And the law was actually uh, ended in Luke 16. As Jesus says to us in the book of Luke, that the, the, the law and the prophets ended with John the Baptist. Once John the Baptist had passed uh, into the kingdom heavenly, his flesh and soul went on to be with the Lord. That was ushering in the new covenant. And the new covenant that was foretold. God had this plan from the beginning of time. It wasn't some of this misconception that God's uh, first plan didn't go well, so he tried plan B. No, God knew the beginning and the end. He knew that the people would have a hardened heart. He gave them the free will of, and, and showing how strong and tough and impossible the law would be. And God, all through the Old Testament, even though there was a law, you know, look at David. Look at David. When David committed murder. David committed adultery, but he repented of his iniquity. He loved the Lord with all his heart, his soul, and his mind. You see it in the Psalms. He, he trusted in the Lord, and that's what the Lord has always been looking for, is our heart. Are we asking for forgiveness? Are we being obedient, obedient to him? And when we fall short, are we asking for forgiveness and getting back on the right track? You look at Moses. Moses, uh, the, the scripture tells us, was the most humble of all men. He, he killed an Egyptian. And God gave him, uh, gave him reformation or restitution through the love that Moses had for the Most High God. And uh, God called him friend. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So the spirit 
uh, the Spirit has come in, the Holy Spirit has come in. Um, go back to verse 4, 5. To redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's important, that we, were, we are redeemed for those who are under the law and we might receive his adoption of sons. We can, so we're grafted in because of Jesus Christ, and we become sons of God, daughters of God, friends of God. Again, all creation is God's creation, but to be called son or daughter of the Most High God is accepting Jesus Christ to do away the, with the law, and also to have it, the only way is, is from the gift of grace. And by saying we love you and having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and being obedient and giving oneself to eliminates the law. Do we say no more law and we can continue to sin and not keep the law? As Paul says, certainly not. Those are still the standards that God, God set up for us, for, our, our, for us to have a better life, a, a way that we don't understand. These things are to hurt us. That's why he gave his precepts and his commandments. But we cannot attain it. And this fleshly body, we need the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to overcome that of the forgiveness of sin. And he has done that for us. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're called an heir of God through Christ. No matter what your skin type, no matter what language, no matter what tribe, we are all brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit through his love and accepting him as our true Lord and Savior. Praise his name. But, when it, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. So when you didn't know the real God, Elohim is the one God. God and Elohim is a Hebrew word meaning three. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, creating a trinity, each of a Godhead, equal part Godhead. With, with, with the name Elohim. Again, Elohim in, in Hebrew can only mean three, and that is the, the, the Trinity. Um, so, but now after you've known God, or rather known by God, how is it that you turn again to weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? He says, now that you, you, you before, going back to eight, you were serving, they were serving other gods. Remember all through the Bible, whether it was Baal or Dagon or Asterisk, there were these poles or there were these uh, fake statues that were of wood. And, and they weren't the true living God who did miracles. The one God who parted the Red Sea took the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt and did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle through his beloved uh, Israel and given the grace even to the Gentiles in the, in the first covenant. Uh, but here he's, Paul is saying, because remember, again, putting this back in perspective, there was false teachers in the, in the teacher of Galatian, teaching them that they had to rely on the law, even though they were Christians. So putting that in perspective, that's what the 4.9 reference. But now after you have known God, so that means you know who God is, you know the way, the truth, and the life is through Jesus Christ, or rather are known by God, meaning, yes, we know God because of Jesus Christ, but he knows us. He, know, he knows us before the beginning of time. And because we accept Jesus Christ, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, accepts us as son or daughter and calls us friend. Oh, wonderful. How is that you turn again to be weak and, and, and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? He's saying, so if you got the free gift, why are you trying to go and set the law back that you have to attain to the law? That is, that's why Jesus paid the price. And don't be fooled by these false teachers that are coming to the, to the area of Galatia. Verse 10, you observe days, months, and seasons, and years. Again, going on to the Jewish festivals. Are we supposed to observe those? Yes, we are. Because those, those festivals are extremely important to God. Even the church today that most, I would say, nine and a half out of ten churches couldn't even tell you the seven, uh, uh, seven festivals of God's uh, holy, um, holy festivals. And is that important to know? Absolutely it's important to know because three of them will be required to go to in the millennial reign. And God's festivals are very important for us to know. And God put them there for a reason. And he symbolically does it for times and seasons. There's always something that happens on these particular uh, festivals. And God's timing is always perfect. And he talks through uh, his timing through these festivals and through the, the Maseroth, through the, through the seasons and the signs. You observe, uh, verse 11, I'm afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. He says, I'm afraid for you unless I've labored in vain. Didn't you understand what I taught you? Now you're having somebody else you teach you something that's com completely against what I was teaching. Again, as Jesus tells us, beware of the, uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing. 
It is a simple truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us and we accept him as Lord and Savior and repent of our sins and be obedient to him and call him Lord. That's it. We're not required to stand up to the law. Should we? Yes, we always should. As Jesus said in the Beatitudes, the, 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 the standards are extremely high and we can't do it without Christ. But we still need to try in our heart, our soul, and our mind. And when we fall short, that's where 1 John 1, 9 comes in. It's called the Christian's Bar of Soap. John was writing to the Christians at that particular time when they fell short of the glory. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and true and will forgive us our sins. Meaning, once we are in Christ and we have salvation, we're going to trip. We're going to fall in our walk. We are, the, the goal is to get stronger and stronger and let the Holy Spirit guide us and, and, let, and let sin be less and less and less. But we still have sin nature in us and we're going to fall short. We're going to lose our temper. We're going to do something that's not right. But God is faithful and true. If we com, com, uh, confess that with our true heart in 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and true and we get on the right track. Meaning get in his word, get into prayer. Verse 13, you know that because of the physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. He's talking about, uh, uh, ver, I'm sorry, verse 12. Br Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not in, uh, injured me at all. He says he's being like me, not in the sense that he's trying to puff himself up, but you know, he, he, that he, was, uh, he got it wrong. He was in the, 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 the top end of Judaism, probably had his doctorate of Judaism, he had an infirmity. Uh, a thorn in the flesh as he prayed to the Lord three times to remove it. He's went through many trials and tribulations and his road to Damascus experience changed his life forever. He became a zealot for the Lord Jesus Christ who was taken out to Arabia for three years, we see in the book of Galatians, and trained by the Holy Spirit and God the Father and Jesus Christ directly to go out and preach to the Gentiles. So that's what he's referring to. In my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as G Christ Jesus. You received me even though I had infirmities. And um, he's going to say in the next one, and I truly, again, this is just my conjecture. Uh, it doesn't matter either way, but my, my belief is that the thorn in the flesh that Paul is referring to is his eyes. And we see that in his letters that he would always end it with a big Paul um, in big letters. Uh, we know his eyes had scales in his road to Damascus. And if you've ever had severe eye problems, and they, they, it just, it's very painful. And verse 15 is going to kind of shed more uh, light on that uh, pun intended um, to show you that it, it was most likely his eyes. Whether it was or it wasn't doesn't matter. Point is... He had inflictions, he had, and, and God told him that I'm giving this to you so that you focus on me because my strength is sufficient, is what he told Paul. So even if we have you know, infirmities in our body, God may be using that for a good purpose. He may use that so it slows our mental and physical bodies down so that we focus on the Lord. He's done that with me in my life. He knew I was an A-type personality, and the after effects of the botulism after two near-death experiences has con completely wiped out my central nervous system, and I'm in chronic fatigue and chronic pain. And that's God's way of saying, hey, you know, this is your infirmity, my son, and the only way you're going to get through this is keeping your focus on me every day. And it's true. I need him every day because of the pain and the chronic fatigue of that I have to go through because of that, similar to what Paul had to endure. Uh, verse 15, when this was a blessing you enjoyed, for I bear you witness that if, uh, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So he's saying you saw the infirmities that I had and the pain and suffering and you, your love for the true gospel at that point before you were corrupted or been attempted to be corrupted by these false teachers, you would have taken your own eyes out and given them to me to spread the word of, the, of Christ Jesus. That's how much you wanted to give up. Uh, self for the glory of the church and glory of God. And that is what God wants from us through Jesus Christ, the love, the love of the church, the love of Christ, to be able to give up oneself and go through the trials and tribulations, even if we have infirmities. God, God is, is, is using it for a purpose. And remember Romans 8, 28, for all things work to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if you love God and you're called according to his purpose, which you are, and you know his purpose, everything works to the good, even though it may be painful for us in the flesh. God is using it for a purpose, his mighty purpose to fulfill his will and keep us focused. He knows what our, our attention span. He knows how Satan can destruct, deceive, 
and destroy us. And sometimes infirmities are being used so that we have to focus on God. When I was in Africa, in Liberia, talking to a pastor and it was, it's, I knew where he was coming because he's coming from. He said, we in, Af- in Liberia have it so much better than you guys do in the United States. And I, I, I knew where he was going to come from because I heard it before. But I said, how so? And he said, uh, because, you know, we don't have the luxuries that you have in the United States and, you know, satellite TV and iPhones and all these distractions and all these material things that just take up our, our, our time and delay us and, 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 and deceive us and, and keep us away from the glory of God. And he says, here in Liberia, we need the Lord every second of every minute of every day just to survive. And we're closer to God. And he's absolutely right. And so God sometimes uses these infirmities uh, for us to focus more on him. And we have to think about where our home is, not in our physical, uh, our, our physical status, because Christ says, my strength is sufficient for you. And it is. Remember, God didn't promise this world for us to be in to be pleasurable. This is not what we're here for. When any pastor that's telling you that you are supposed to be here for the pleasure of God and God wants you to be rich and, 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 and have abundance and Mercedes and, and, and a rich house and a mansion, that's, not, that's, not, that's absolutely not scripturally sound. That's the, it's the, the opposite. Will God bless you? Yes, he will bless you, but he'll bless you of the things that you need, not the things that you want. And he knows your heart and he knows how you will use them because he knows you better than yourself. So again, it goes back to the talents, the, the, the parable of talents. The one that had 10 talents used them properly. So that's part of our wilderness period, God using us with money. How are we going to use that money? If we get the money, are we going to give it back to grow the kingdom glory? That's what he wants of us. He wants to bless us, but not bless us so that we're, you know, gather up silver and gold for ourselves. Remember going back to, to Solomon and, and, and going back to the law. It says you should not gather up silver and gold for yourself. So that means st- gathering up riches for your own purpose, your own vanity, your own glory. No, God wants to give us these, these blessings to spread the gospel from east to west to north to south to spread, spread his glory. And there will be pain and suffering. There will be trials and tribulations because Christ told us so. And we take that as a badge of courage like Paul and Silas did in the jail of Philippi. They were beaten one, one uh, lash before their death. And what did they do? They sung hymns and praise and brought people to Christ in pain and affliction. Paul had this, this element of a thorn in the flesh, his entire, his entire ministry. And that was a way God was using the, uh, Paul to be focused on him. And that's what we are to be too. Focus on the Lord, spreading his glory. And he will give us what we need, not what we want. And we will face trials and tribulations because Jesus said the world hated me before it hated you. That's why he wants us to stand up strong, not deny his name, not deny his word. The world is coming against the Christian community, the word of God, especially here in America again. And it is being politically incorrect to say God's word is truth. And we are to stand, stand tall and not deny his name or deny his word no matter what afflictions that brings with it. Our home is not here. We are just a vapor passing through. As Solomon said, a fading flower. Our home is on the high with the Lord Jesus Christ once we accept him. God has a great plan in store for us for eternity. And once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God calls us son and daughter, and he holds us in our hand and says, now let me work with you. I am the molder, you are the clay. Let me use this wilderness period so you can fulfill my will in your life. And that will is, 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 could be bringing other people, that fan, friend, friends and family into the kingdom of the Lord and knowing what the most important thing is. Lord said to me several times, he said, my son, the only thing matters in this life is what you do for me. It's not that I became a director of three Fortune 100 companies, wasn't the the youngest director in the history of one company, the youngest district manager in another company, number one in sales uh, in many, many companies, turning around countless different divisions, means nothing, nothing. The only thing that matters is what we do in the name of the Most High God, praise his name. Uh, verse 16, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now have you turned it on me is what Paul says because I tell you the truth and the truth is the Lord Jesus Christ. that They zealously court you but 
for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them, zealous for the wrong reasons. And Paul's going to tell you, there's nothing wrong with being a zealot as long as the zealot is for the truth. And that is the word of God and being all for Christ. But it is good to be zealous in good things always, and not only when I'm present with you. My little children, from whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. So he, Paul is saying he's laboring and has a birth pain so that you can be born again in the spirit to those who are non-believers and to continue to uh, feed those who are still infants and keep them on the right path of the God's word. Um, but he's talking that it's okay to be a zealot if you're a zealot for Christ. And we can see Paul was a zealot in Judaism and he had the zealot wrong because he was a zealot for the law. And God had to re, re, uh, retrain him in, the, in Arabia for three years and give him the thorn in the flesh, and this is what's key, so that he wouldn't go overboard thinking it was about self because God says my strength is sufficient. Because when you do it in your strength, then you start thinking I did this instead of giving the glory to God. And when you have a thorn in the flesh like Paul has and like I have, you know there's no way you can do it on your own. The only way it can happen is through the strength of the Most High God through the Son of Jesus Christ because we are physically weak because of the, the trial, the tribulation, or the thorn in the flesh that the Lord's gave him. But he gave it for a good purpose, and the good purpose is for us to be zealots to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and be zealots to the truth. I would uh, like to present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So he's changed the tone a little bit. He's concerned about the, the, the teachings of the church. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? See, so why do you desire to be under the law? We gave you something that is much better. In Jeremiah 31, 31, God told Jeremiah that there was a new, there was a new covenant coming. He had a plan from the beginning of the time. This covenant would be better because nobody could stand up to the law and how holy God is, and nobody could be perfect to that. No one, not Moses, not Daniel. And if Moses and Daniel can't do it, none of us can do it because we're all of a sin nature, and it takes the, 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 the trials and tribulations of our Christ to go onto the cross and die for our sins, past, present, and future. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman, meaning Hagar, Hagar and Sarai, or Sarah. And one was, the, one was the, uh, the son of the promise, the everlasting covenant, Isaac. And one was giving a blessing, but it wasn't the covenant. Um, but he who was of the bond, uh, bondwoman was born according to the flesh. So she was born according to the flesh. Remember, God never told them to do that. They took it upon themselves. And he of the free woman through promise. And that was the promise of Isaac. God was going to say that he had a plan that it was Sarah was going to be the mother of Isaac and start the, the, the nation of Israel. And Isaac would be God, um, uh, Jacob, and the, then the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, it doesn't matter. If we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as Paul said earlier, we're grafted in. We become adopted. We're all of the family. We're called sons and daughters of the Most High God, praise his name. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai and, and, and Arabia. Isn't that interesting that Mount Sinai is Arabia and that's where the home of Islam. And in Islam it teaches that, um, that the promise went from, uh, uh, from Abraham to Ishmael instead of from Abraham to Isaac. So Satan again is the destruction or the deceiver of the word. And that's where the two holy places are in the world, Arabia and Jerusalem. But one is true. One is of the of the promise of the Lord. But yet, even if you're born of the, in bondage of the bondwoman, even if you're um, an Arab, or whatever nationality or tribe you come from, or whatever you speak, you can be grafted into the Most High God, Elohim, through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and be called son or daughter. Every brother and sister around all over His glory nation, we become one under the one Lord. Praise His name. Jerusalem and, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in the bondage with her children. So Jerusalem is God's holy city. That's why it's so important in Scripture that Jerusalem is his, his holy city where Christ will come down in the millennial reign and literally reign from Jerusalem, fulfilling the Davidic covenant. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother, mother of us all. Verse 27 is quoting Isaiah 54, 1. 
For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Meaning the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28. Now we, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. We all are children of the promise. We may not be Jewish. I happen to be Jewish. I just found this out a couple years ago. Um, but whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. We become one in Christ. It doesn't matter your nationality. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is, becomes Lord and host for, for all men, women, no matter their nationality, the race, or tribe, or tongue they come from. We are all brothers and sisters of the Most High God. But as he was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so as now. So it's born of the, of, of, of the Spirit is the most important thing, being born again, trusting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And verse 429, that's Genesis 21, 9, um, referencing uh, the... the uh, the blessing of the covenant, verse 30, was also referencing 21, Genesis 21.10. Nevertheless, what does Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So that's when Hagar and Ishmael were cast out because the covenant was, was to be with um, Isaac forever. And, and anybody, even back in that time, uh, Gentiles could be grafted in. As you can see under the Torah, uh, the law always stated that, that the, the, the foreigners could become in. And obviously Jesus Christ died for all people, all kingdom, all tribes, all nations, because he will be called Lord of the earth, Lord of all of heaven and earth, Lord of all things. And every knee will bow down to him, no matter what our background, no matter who our father and mother are, we all can have the same father spiritually Abraham and Jesus Christ God the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and we be brothers and sisters forever praise God praise his holy name and verse 31 closing this out so then brethren we're not children of the bondwoman but of the free we are free because of Jesus Christ we are free because of God's promise and his word praise his holy not the holy name and that ends Galatians 4 may the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob bless each and every one of you and we pray that through the blood of Jesus Christ, each and every one of you that may not be Jewish are grafted in. Remember the Jewish people, you know, they're God's people, but they have to accept the Messiah as Lord and Savior. We all have to accept the Messiah as Lord and Savior, and that is Jesus Christ, and that is for the way, the truth, and the life. And the scripture says the narrow is the way, narrow is the gate. Not everyone will get it, and wide is the, is, is the other way. And we pray that each and every one of you on this accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jew, Gentile, does not matter. As this Paul is telling us in Galatians, once we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, repent of our sins and be obedient to his word, we are all one in the body of church and of Christ forever. We become the bride and he is the groom and we're married with him forever in paradise. Praise his holy name. Again, we will see you on uh, the next time. God bless.